ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, this may come as a shock to you, but only 38 percent of voters think Biden will be alive at the end of his second term. And more than a third believe Kamala Harris will be president by January 2029 if 81 year old is reelected. I see a whole bunch of stories popping up. Democrats are panicking that they're losing minority voters. And uh, you know why? Well, aside from the fact that they're releasing uh, untold numbers of criminal aliens into the country that are displacing many small and poor communities, aside from that, nobody thinks Joe Biden's going to make it anyway. So whoever you're, if, if everybody knows you're not voting for Biden, you're voting Harris 2028 or I guess 2026. I don't know. We don't know how long Joe Biden's going to make it. Now, I say this with all due respect. Um, when John McCain died, I know everybody hates the guy. Not, not literally everybody, but, you know, people of sound conscience are not fans of John McCain. And uh, that being said, I do not take pleasure in celebrating death. When uh, John McCain died, many on the left, the, uh, every political faction except for the centrists were cheering for his demise. Except I, not me. Um, and then I found that meme where they were like normie centrists were like sad, you know, sad, sad. And I'm like, dude, you're never going to convince me to celebrate a person's death. Uh, I, I don't like any of it. I think it's a slippery slope. I think we should lament the loss of opportunity. John McCain could have been better. He did have a crazy story, and it's not all bad warmongering and things like that. But it's not good. It's not good. That being said, the reason I bring this up is that uh, I don't like Joe Biden, but I certainly would not celebrate his demise. I certainly would not encourage anything bad to happen to him. I think the dude should be sitting in a wheelchair with a blanket on his lap in the sun, enjoying his golden years, relaxing, talking to his kids. I think he's had a bad career. I think he's a bad guy. I think there's a lot of people in prison who are bad people, too. But you get to a certain age and it's like, well, what do you do? You bring them to their home and you say the ride has come to an end. But there are a lot of people who are nasty, I guess. Outside of that, my point is this. The average American is well aware that Joe Biden cannot, will not, probably won't even make it. We don't even know if he's going to make it to the end of this year. He's well past the average life expectancy of a U.S. male, which I believe is 73. And so at this point, with the stumbling, with the fumbling, with the with the, the sunken eyes, it ain't looking too good. And we're supposed to entertain this. Now, most people get it. So when we look to bigger stories, we have this from the Wall Street Journal. This is the great shift. Why Democrats are losing their grip on Latino voters. How, how's this from The Guardian? Black and Hispanic voters deserting the Democratic Party in large numbers. The Democratic Party is crumbling. It's crumbling. So I wonder, as we move forward, what will we get? Now, of course, it wouldn't be a, a political segment talking about Democrats falling apart without bringing up Israel, which is a large component of the collapse right now. Donald Trump has no problem saying that he is the most pro-Israel candidate. Democrats are struggling because their multicultural coalition includes many cultures that don't like Israel. And so in Minnesota and in Michigan, Joe Biden is in trouble in these key areas. In Dearborn, where you have many Muslims who are not happy about what's going on with Israel and Palestine. And then in Minnesota with Somalis, who are also very similar. I believe they're mostly Muslim as well. Michael Rapoport finally wakes up and supports Trump over Biden. So this segment is not just to talk about Biden being old and people not want to vote for him. It's about all of the reasons. And I think what we're seeing now is the great shift as the Democratic Party loses any meaningful reason to vote for him, any, any, any meaningful core ideology. Now, we had this conversation with Alad Eliyahu. He reports for SCNR, field reporting. And he said he thinks the Republicans are, gonna, are falling apart and this is it for them. And I said, how? He said, well, without Trump, they have no charismatic figure. I said, no, the problem with the Republicans, they have too big of a backbench. Oh, man. Carrie Lake, Christy Nome. Ron DeSantis, I know, but yes, Ron DeSantis, his successes in Florida cannot be discounted, despite the fact the man does not know how to campaign at a national level. He still is a successful and powerful voice. You've got Vivek Ramaswamy. You've got uh, uh, at, at, a, at a lower tier, you have people like Tim Scott. And uh, you, Al Brusewitz running for uh, Congress now, 
these are the younger guys who are stepping up. Then, of course, you've got Matt Gates, You've got J.D. Vance. You've got a massive backbench. And I'm probably forgetting many people, not to mention the powerful voices that come with people like Lauren Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, what do you have on the Democrat side? Taint no backbench. People are like, Gavin Newsom. Oh, come on. Give me Gavin Newsom policy. Sorry, I can tell you everything Ron DeSantis has done. I can tell you why people are happy about him. Ain't nobody happy about what's going on in California. The Democratic Party is, is fracturing. And although I don't, uh, 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 like, I, I don't, there's, there are people who are just, they have Israel derangement syndrome. I do think Israel may be one of the largest components. And I will make sure to make this distinction in the segment about the difference between true criticism of Israel and Israel derangement syndrome. But first, let me share with you some words from Michael Rapoport. In all honesty, I have educated myself so much since 2016, and I have a ways to go. My political views have changed immensely, and they're changing at a rapid pace. I will not vote for Joe Biden. I do not support anybody from the squad. I think they're totally full of shit. Uh, let me, he, he, he does rag on the squad quite a bit. Voting for Trump is on the table. There we go. People are like, what are you talking about? That's my reality. That is my reality. I will not support anybody who's anti-Israel. I will not support anybody that is anti, uh, um, you know, making America safe. I'm not supporting anybody that is cool with the fact that it takes me two and a half hours to get back into America from Toronto uh, uh, at the... Um, what, the, what is it called? The passport at the um, passport control, the line to go from Toronto to New York. It takes me two and a half hours, as it should. But it takes you two minutes to cross the border. I'm not down with that shit. I'm not down with police officers in the greatest city on Earth getting beaten up. And uh, uh, you're a legal immigrant. And then you have no bail. I'm not uh, down and with and flipping off the camera, flipping off the fucking camera like Chupac when he got arrested and he was coming out in the in the. In the red Detroit what Red Wings t-shirt. I'm going to fact check that one. The guy who flipped up the camera was, was an illegal immigrant, but was wrongly accused. He was not the guy who actually attacked that cop. That's my understanding. And so the reason why he was flipping him off is because he was like, I'm not the guy. And everyone assumes they just let him go. That's not the case. But I, I suppose that could be wrong. But I'm not down with going into a Costco or a 7-Eleven or a Rite Aid, as I videotaped once and went crazy viral, cleaning out the spot and walking like you're, you're on a, you know, like a beautiful spring day walk. I'm not down with any of that shit. Here we are. Michael Rapoport, who so famously would scream to the camera that Trump was bad and that he had had, had a, uh, and I quote, pig dick is now saying Trump's on the table. <clears throat> he's not saying Trump's on the table. He's saying he's voting Trump. He's still a little worried about saying it. That's why he's saying it's on the table. He's not voting for Biden. He's voting for Trump. I think it's fair that he's somewhat reluctant to just outright come and say it. Joe Rogan, same way. Many of these people will not come out in a minute. But I'll tell you this. I'd be willing to bet that Anna Kasparian of the Young Turks also votes for Donald Trump. I really do think so. Trump, Trump has got character defects, and that's an understatement. But Trump also has done a lot of good things. And I think foreign policy wise, he's the greatest president of my generation. I think the economy was going really well. Spending was a bit, was a bit out of control. Drone strikes. Absolutely. No way am I going to say that this is the best president who ever lived like many people who are Trump supporters would. I think if you if you ignore the legitimate criticisms that many people have, you're not going to actually get them to listen. But I think when you look at what's going on now, when you see Democrats bleeding support, when you see these never Trump or anti Trump guys like Rappaport coming out and being like, I can't do this, man. The great shift is upon us. Anna Kasparian, Young Turks, you're saying what? No way she votes Trump. So here I am playing poker with the boys, as I often do. Actually, I haven't played in a couple of weeks. We've been doing a lot of skateboarding, but uh, we're playing poker. And uh, there was a couple of guys there who were into politics and knew I was and were asking about it. And they said, no way that happens. No way. She, Young Turks, nah. And I said, you need to listen to what she's saying. You need to listen to Anna Kasparian. You need to see what she's upset about. You need to see the facts she's reporting. She's right all the way. Now, maybe she doesn't like that I'm saying she's going to vote for Trump. Maybe that puts some heat on her. 
But a year ago, leftists and liberals were calling her the next Dave Rubin. I think that's meant to be insulting to Anna Kasparian. What I'm saying is this. People like Michael Rapoport and Anna Kasparian have started to take a look into what's going on more and more. And they've they've often you've been watching what's going on. But now it's gotten so bad that you're really between a rock and a hard place for Anna. The Young Turks had advocate, namely Jenk, for bail reform. Now, me personally, I'm in favor of bail reform. I want you all to understand this. A guy's walking down the street and uh, he's wearing uh, blue jeans and a white shirt. And a guy in blue jeans and a white shirt robs a, a bodega, a corner store. He runs out. He runs, turns the corner, jumps into an alley and hides in a garbage can. The cops run by and see the wrong guy. And they arrest him. And this guy's like, yo, what's going on? And they're like, you're under arrest. He's like, what? I wasn't even in there. Like, I wasn't even in there. Like, nice try, buddy. So he goes to jail. They say, this is a guy. And now this guy gets to spend the weekend in jail. He misses two days of work. He doesn't answer the phone. Nobody knows where he is. Two days, no call, no show. Company fires him. Monday comes around. He goes in to a hearing. He says, I'm not guilty. They got the wrong guy. And say, everybody says that. Okay. Should this guy have to put up cash? Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of people are going to be like, that's never going to happen. That's so rare. doesn't matter. The system should not be allowed to imprison someone for any amount of time without a hearing instantly. As soon as the person's arrested, before they're forced to stay in that jail, they should get a hearing. That's how it's supposed to be. But we broke the system because we can't handle it anymore. Short of a preponderance of evidence where the person is a violent threat, this is the challenge we face. This guy gets out. The court says, wrong guy. They picked up the right guy. You're free to go. And he goes, I lost my job. He goes into his job and says, I got wrongly arrested. And they're like, look, I don't know. Like, it's a corporate company. You know, they, you, you know the rules. That's it. You're fired. Some people might say, no company. would." Yes, they would. There are companies that I've worked for. They don't care what your reason is. When I worked for American Airlines Regional, which is American Eagle, in your first six months, if you are late two times, two times, they fire you. And they say the reason does not matter. Union contract, we all agreed. You're late the first time. I, uh, I got a flat tire. Doesn't matter. And that actually happened to me. And uh, it was really funny. Me and my friend, he got a flat tire. We were driving to work together. I was like 18. And he was like, we're going to be late. And we ended up making it on time. But it was scary. Imagine you work for a big corporate chain like that. You get wrongly arrested uh, and then they hold you. It's worse. I mean, the bail thing is much worse than that, because let's say you go for a judge and he's like bail set $10,000. Like, I don't have I don't have that money. It's like, well, you only need a thousand dollars to put up. I don't have that. Then we're holding you for three months until your trial's complete. Boom, your life's destroyed. You lose your apartment. You got, you got a dog. Good luck. You have to call somebody and ask him to take care of it. Who knows? Rent's not getting paid. You get evicted. You lose your job. You get out. Then what? Now, the problem with, the, with, with New York is that it's reasonable to say this, everything I just did. But I also recognized well early on that this was going to lead to them just letting criminals go because they'd already been doing it. And so this is not the path towards solving this problem. There may be no good solution here. The Young Turks said bail reform. What happened? Anna Kasparian now is shocked to find that there were four, four people, I believe it was, who had blood and guts in their drain pipes, body parts strewn about. They tried hiding the body parts. And the police said it, they're not bail eligible, so they're free to go. Bail eligible meaning they, they're not eligible to be held with, with bond. They're free to go. And they were told, don't miss your court dates. And Anna went off. What? If this is what it means to be on the left, I am not left anymore, she said. And Jack deflects. No, 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 no. I don't know how anyone you see with Michael Rapoport, you see with Anna Kasparian, you can see with what's going on. There was this video that went viral, and I believe it was in Chicago, of black voters chanting, no more vote blue or something like that. So you got to vote red now. You got to vote Republican. And I wonder if this is kind of like with Jimmy Carter, where you get these policies that just go so bad that people just, I, I love it. People are like Ronald Reagan is the greatest president. No, he's not. Gun control, no fault divorce. I get it. A lot of that came from when he was governor. But he was certainly not. He was uh, mentally stagnant, will, will be nice in his later years. And there are people who are like traditional conservatives who are like, blasphemy, he was the best. No. I mean, I wasn't alive, so. 
I think I was like two, actually. But the point is, it was actually that Jimmy Carter did so bad that Ronald Reagan looked great by comparison. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even say it's necessarily Jimmy Carter. Certainly it was a lot. But it was also the Fed with interest rates, which, you know, you could blame on him and all, and all that. People were not happy with interest rates the way I think they were like 20 something percent. So it was particularly brutal. Economy was not doing too well. Well, here we are today. There are going to be people, I believe, like Anna Kasparian. She may never admit it, but I can't see how someone like Joe Rogan or Anna Kasparian. Rogan less so. Rogan I get. But like the people who, like Rogan said, I, I would vote for Trump over Biden or something to that effect. He didn't outright say, I am going to vote for Donald Trump. He said, Biden's not even there. I can understand why Anna would not want to say publicly she voted for Trump. But I can't understand how knowing what she knows, she would go into the ballot box and be like, Joe Biden. It makes no sense. To be fair, maybe she votes third party. Maybe she votes RFK Jr. Recognize that. RFK Jr. is pushing back on a lot of this craziness, but still fairly woke himself. The issue now is that if Democrats really are losing, uh, <laughs> if they're really losing minority voters, they can't win. Take a look at this from CNN. The Biden campaign makes direct appeal to Haley supporters in new digital ad. They're actually trying to convince Republicans to go Democrat. Could this be the great shift? Populists, whether they like Trump or not, vote for Trump. And the establishment coalesces around itself. Could it be the realignment is not left and right? And it's not that like I used to be on the left, but then the left went too far left. And what happens is you get the likes of Anna Kasparian. Michael Rapoport just coming out and being like Trump. You get a realignment where neocons join the neolibs and create the, the neoliberal conservative party and populists form the like American populist coalition. I wonder. Haley voters probably will vote for Biden. Not all of them, but many of them. Many of the people who supported Haley actually were Biden voters who are lying in the first place. But I don't see how Biden is able to maintain anything. It's a facade. The uniparty establishment is in shambles. What does that mean for this country? I don't know. It may mean the end of the great American empire, which many leftists should appreciate. They never wanted in the first place. It could, it could mean the rise of China, which could be bad for everybody. I care about America. I don't care about colonization and empire. You know, Joe Biden over the weekend announced that the 31st would be Transgender Day of Visibility. Just so happened to be Easter. And what people don't realize is that that's the day before April Fool's Day. Hmm. Weird day to choose. But of course, many people were saying that this was pandering to the left. And then, of course, on Easter Sunday, he posted a message in support of Easter or whatever saying, Happy Easter. You can't have it both ways. You can't do it. The funny thing is, the mayor of London then said, Transgender Day of Visibility. And I'm like, that's an American thing. But they're doing it in London? Wow. The mayor of London is a, uh, I suppose the UK is now a vassal of the United States. How about that? I mean, maybe not. My point is, at least the United States, the Democrats are desperately trying to play it both ways because they need to win, the, win over the progressives on issues like Israel-Palestine, but they can't. Republicans don't have to do that. What may end up happening is that you end up with such a crisis in America itself. Everything else becomes ancillary. And you get these liberals like Rappaport who have no choice but to just vote for Donald Trump. I vote for Trump. It's on the table. And he might say Trump's bad for this, that, or this reason. But, you know, I think Michael's realizing what many of us realized a long time ago. The man has character defects. He's funny, too. But what are you going to do? Vote for Joe Biden? The funny thing is for Michael, Israel was the real wake up call. And that's where I think the Democratic Party is completely fractured. They stand no chance. This fracturing of the Democratic Party due to the issue of Israel is untenable. On the Republican side, you have two issues. You have uh, you have the issue of America first versus the issue of pro-Israel. Support for Israel. Now, Lauren Boebert, for instance, very pro-Israel. Me, I'm, man, I just don't care. I don't know why it has anything to do with me. The Balfour Declaration was 100 years ago. 
Look, I, I got no beef with Israel. Cue all the uh, anti-Israel people. But let me tell you about Israel derangement syndrome versus Israel criticism versus the Israel neutral. Israel derangement syndrome are these people to where, like, no matter what you say, they're shrieking Zionist and they claim Jews are responsible for everything. And I'm like, y'all are crazy. It's the same as wokeness. It's like the woke people are deranged and the and there's anti-Israel derangement. But then there's legitimate criticism of Israel. I mean, Rogan brought it up. These four guys are walking in a drone strike, missiles slam into them. And we want we want answers to ask what that, is, what, what that is. Why is the U.S. supporting this? It's not our, like, why are we involved? Why is the U.S. building a port in Gaza that's colonization? I don't want to be involved in any of it. I'm sick of it. But I, Israel can do it, whatever. It's a foreign country. I care about as much, is it, I care about Israel as much as I care about Sudan or Burma. The Israel derangement people think it's like everything. I'm like, there's bigger conflicts in the world right now. As for the left, though, the left is Israel derangement. That's the only thing they care about, the far left. There are liberals who support Israel, and now you've got a problem. Michael Rapoport was one of them. He ain't going to vote for Joe Biden. He doesn't want to be involved with the Democrats now. Trump's going to come out and be like, yeah, I'm for Israel. And then what do I see? Me and many others are going to be like, don't, I don't care. Trump is the guy who is setting up peace, Abraham Accords. And I know some libertarians don't like that. But he's also the guy who is trying to get our troops out. I will take it. And then Trump's his pro-Israel and a lot of people want to vote for him. I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't care that much about Israel. And so here you are, a coalition being built where former liberals who support Israel are going to say, I'll take it. Pro-Israel people will say, I'll take it. Anti-Israel people can coalesce around the Democratic Party if they want. But even Joe Biden's desperate to maintain these large Democrat donors. In the end, I don't see how Biden can make this play sh short of some kind of uh, shadow campaign. But I suppose we'll see. As the polls continue... We just see more and more people breaking away from the Democratic Party. What more could you get? I think we're beyond the 2020 tactics, but hey, we'll see. Good luck, I guess. I think things are looking pretty good for us. Next segment is coming up at 4 p.m. on this channel. Thanks for hanging out, and I'll see you all then.